This is U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell at the United Nations promoting the invasion of Iraq with an extraordinary theater of the absurd. Iraq declared 8,500 liters of anthrax, but UNSCOM estimates that Saddam Hussein could have produced 25,000 liters. If Nothing of what he claimed was true. All these pictures were meaningless. Saddam Hussein's intentions have never changed. He is not developing the missiles for self-defense. These are missiles that Iraq wants in order to project power, to threaten, and to deliver chemical, biological, and, if we let him, nuclear warheads. Colin Powell's incredible performance was never seriously challenged in the American broadcast media, of which Rupert Murdoch's Fox Television is the biggest network. Like the rest of the Murdoch empire, it backed the invasion. We expect every American to support our military, and if they can't do that, to shut up. How do you steer this thing? I mean, there's no, I mean, you have a stick, is that right? Sure, we have a... Uh, both but the cartoon journalism of Fox can often overshadow the fact that the respectable media has played a critical part in promoting war. Like Fox, the celebrated New York Times published the false claims that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. The paper apologized to its readers one year later. In Britain, The Observer, another respected liberal newspaper, published the same false claims. David, you've written about your articles in The Observer in the build-up to the Iraq invasion that you feel, and I quote you, nauseated, angry and ashamed about what you wrote. What did you mean exactly? It's now, and has been for a number of years, very painfully apparent that uh, the facts that I believed to be true in those articles were not true. They were a pack of lies fed to me by a fairly um, sophisticated disinformation campaign. But didn't it occur to you that these people were professional liars? I overcame what should have been stronger doubts. I, 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 can, make, I can make no excuses. Yeah. I, sh I, no. I, 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 mean, you, I should I, have been more sceptical. I mean, you finished off one of your articles by expressing almost a little editorial at the end, in which you wrote that for the West, Iraq was, and I quote, an ideal place to establish a bridgehead. There are occasions in history, you wrote, when the use of force is both right and sensible. This is one of them. I mean, in essence, you were advocating <clears throat> an attack yes. on a defenceless country. That's quite something, isn't it? What has happened, the enormity of what has happened in Iraq is far bigger than, mm. you know, my own embarrassment, my own feelings. And what happened was a crime. Uh, it, it, it was a crime on a, on a very large scale. Um, uh, Does that make a journalist's accomplices? Yeah, broadly. Mm. Unwitting, perhaps, but, but yes. This CBS News special report is part of our continuing coverage of America at War. Here is Dan Rather. For 24 years, the most famous news anchor on American television was Dan Rather. Your own career is remarkable for many things, but one of them in that you you have stood up to power your uh, questioning of Nixon, which I remember in, back in 74, and uh, also your interview over Rangate with uh, Bush Sr. Uh, but then later on, you appeared on the, famously, on the David Letterman show, uh, which I happened to see, and uh, you, you, you said um, George Bush is the president, he makes the decisions, and you know, as just one American, wherever he wants me to line up, just tell me where and he'll make the call. Wh why did you say that? This was in the almost immediate wake of 9-11, and that's the way I genuinely felt. I was responding as an American citizen in a personal way, and I have said that whether those of us in journalism want to admit it or not, then at least in some small way, uh, fear is present in every newsroom in the country 
a fear of losing your job, a fear of your the institution, the company you work for going out of business, the fear of being stuck with some label, unpatriotic or otherwise, that you will have with you to your grave and beyond, um, the, the fear that there's so much at stake for the country that by doing what you deeply feel is your job will sometimes be embarrassed at this. All of these things go into the mix. But it's very important for me to say, because I firmly believe it, I'm not the vice president in charge of excuses, mm -hmm. that we shouldn't have excuses. What we should do is take a really good look at that period and learn from it and, you know, suck up our courage. Charles Hanley, who won the Pulitzer Prize for reporting, was in Iraq in January of 2003. He went to every site that had been named by George Bush, Cheney, Rice, Colin Powell, and he found that in every case, they were still sealed since 1991 by when they had been sealed by UN inspectors. He filed a report on January 18th. It went to every major newsroom in the United States because it's the AP, which goes to every major newsroom in the United States. Got no pickup. It no didn't fit the script. It. it didn't fit the script. It got virtually no pickup. It didn't fit the script. We were going to war no matter what. I think that if that good media coverage, good journalism that tells truth to power can make a huge, huge difference. So do I think that we would have gone to war if the media had done their job and it challenged not just the lies about weapons of mass destruction, but the lies about how, how Saddam kicked the inspectors out in 1998 and the whole, the whole litany of propaganda that led up to uh, you know, March 20th, 2003, the launch of the war. I think if the media had been challenging that, there's no, I, I think we would not have gone to war. Jeremy Paxman said last year he and the rest of the media had been hoodwinked in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq. Is that something that you would agree with? Um, well, what I think I would say about that is that clearly we did not realise until much later in the day uh, that the weapons of mass destruction were not there. And of course there was the so-called dodgy dossier as mm. well. So mm. there is quite a body of evidence to build up to suggest mm. that the media certainly were taken in by the claims that were uh, coming from government at that point, yes. Why didn't the media get it? Why didn't the BBC get it? I think that we didn't get it partly because of lack of access. If you want to find out what's happening, then you really need to go there and do some first-hand reporting, uh, which wasn't possible in the run-up to the war in Iraq. But the crucial facts were available. The chief United Nations weapons inspector in Iraq, Scott Ritter, gave me this interview four years before the invasion. In 1991, Iraq had significant capability in the area of chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons production capability, and long-range ballistic missile manufacturing capability. By 1998, the chemical weapons infrastructure had been completely dismantled or destroyed by UNSCOM or by Iraq in compliance with UNSCOM's mandate. The biological weapons program had been declared in its totality late in the game, but it was gone. All the major facilities eliminated. The nuclear weapons program, again, completely eliminated. The long-range ballistic missile program, completely eliminated. All that was left was the research and development and manufacturing capability for missiles with a range less than 150 kilometers, a permitted activity. Everything that we set out to destroy in 1991, the physical infrastructure had been eliminated. So if I had to quantify Iraq's threat in terms of weapons of mass destruction, the real threat is zero, none. The former chief weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, was saying as early as 1998 that Saddam Hussein was completely disarmed. Scott Ritter, I think, appeared in 2003 twice, and once at three in the morning on uh, BBC 24 News. He was a vital expert witness, and there were others. 
Well, I don't know why Scott Ritter didn't appear more, but it, he clearly did well, appear a, at that's times. That's the question for the BBC. Why, why weren't those who were Why weren't those witnesses? voices heard? Yes. Well, because there were also other voices that we were putting on the air, Unscombe, Mohammed al Baradei, Hans Blix. So we were actually listening to, to those voices. But, yeah, I think you've got a good point. You know, why, why didn't we? It's a question that we asked ourselves afterwards. Why was it that we didn't discover this first, uh, didn't discover the state of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction? I think what, what critics of that would say is that the broadcasters, notably the BBC, echoed or amplified the lies told in the run-up to the invasion, rather than investigating itself. What the BBC, though, have a duty to do is to report what governments and their representatives are saying, which we, of course, did. We were just reporting, quite legitimately, the claims that people at the time were making. They weren't legitimate claims, though. They were in the mouths of legitimate leaders, though, and therefore we had a duty to report that. But those leaders, both of them you mentioned, Blair and Bush, have long been discredited. I mean, isn't it the BBC's role, as well as reporting what politicians say, to hold power to account? Of course it is. It's, always, it's, our, it's the BBC's duty to scrutinise what it is that people say. We're not there to accuse them of lying, though, because that's a judgment. No, 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 that's not being suggested, that you make a judgment. The point is that it appears now that those important journalistic challenges were never made. It's not up to me to make a judgment. We're there to report what their claims are and hold them up to scrutiny uh, and, and investigate. In August 2002, ITV reported a warning by Vice President Cheney that Iraq would soon have a nuclear weapon. And that was nonsense. But it was presented uncritically as news. Wouldn't you say that that contributed to the, the invasion that happened the following March? Well, it might have done, but with respect, not our fault. I mean, I, I don't believe that you're suggesting, are you, that we should completely dismiss the words of arguably the second most powerful man in the Western world. We uh, reported no. it. We didn't necessarily agree with it. We reported it and, uh, uh, and allowed our viewers to make up their minds as to whether this was a man telling the truth or not. No, but, that, but that's not fair on viewers, is it? Because they may not know what we as journalists know or ought to know that this was an extremely well, dodgy yeah. politician well, who was making, it, was making extraordinary claims. If we knew it, we should yeah. have said so. If mm. we didn't know it, we can't. And that applies across everything. Um, but you're absolutely right in one regard. We shouldn't take things at face value. We should do our best to investigate. And when we do know, we should tell our viewers. Of course we should. That's part of the, the process of being uh, a journalistically based organisation. I mean, I was thinking of... Uh, of Blair's many statements. One, on the 29th of January 2003, ITV News reported Blair is saying, we do know of links between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. Mm. These links, as you know, didn't exist. I mean, we're getting into the realms of, of, of sort of semantics now, but if... Well, he, they're he, very well, important well, no, semantics, He, he used they? the word links mm. between the two. Your quotation, not mine. Well, I think that was a quotation from yeah, ITV from Tony News. Blair, yeah, yeah, from Tony Blair. Yeah. Links. Now, links can mean a thousand things. It doesn't necessarily mean a bond of support. Of there were no support. links. Well, I, look, I'm sitting here across you. You're telling me that. I would say to you, well, show me that there were no links. Show me that they'd never... Oh. Show oh. me that they'd never... Even those claiming links said there, there were no links. Show me that there never any communications of any kind between those two organisations. Come on. It's impossible to do that. And he okay. chose his words carefully. And of course... Well, we're, they're not we're, careful. We're, we're, we do know of links between Al-Qaeda and Iraq. Yeah, but the word links yeah. could mean a thousand things, is the point I'm saying here. And you're not suggesting, I'm sure, that we shouldn't have reported what the Prime Minister was saying. You were talking about semantics a little while ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I find it virtually impossible to believe that Britain could have got away with the invasion of Iraq um, if the media had been doing its job. When Blair was standing up and saying our, our, our policy in the region was to bolster, bolster the forces of democracy, I mean, really, the proper reaction to that would have been to burst out laughing. 
<clears throat> there's simply no history of that at all. Britain has, has been on the side of authoritarian repressive regimes. They are our allies, the Omanis, the Saudis, the Egyptians. They are our allies, not the, the more democratic, more liberal forces in the region. And I think that if journalists had even had a, 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 a slight uh, interest in looking at the history and in looking at, the, at, at what, uh, the, what the government was actually saying at the time or what the evidence was at the time, they would have reported things in such a manner that the government just would not have been able to have got away with what they did.